Talks at the Martini Siegel Theater Center at the Grady Center CUNY in Midtown Manhattan in New York. Uh, it's a sunny day. Uh, the town um, is filling up, something we missed last year, but now the streets are full. But still, everybody seems to be wearing masks, and we are all nervous of what the future um, will bring. And back with us um, is the great uh, Anne Bogart, um, the wonderful uh, and significant and influential American theater director. And uh, she will join us, and we will talk about her new work, uh, which is not a stage on a play, which she has done so, so, so many. It's a, one of her books, and she wrote it in the last year in the time of Corona. And thank you, thank you for joining. Where are you and how are you? Uh, thank you, Frank, it's great to be back with you. And I'm here in uh, Brian Kulik's office at Columbia because I just finished teaching a class. And if there's noise outside, I might have to get up and tell people to be quiet. So That's Frank, fine. you tell me if it's too loud. But you know, I'm delighted to see you. And I'm gonna say again, what I've said to you before because I mean it more this time than I did the last time, which was how many months into COVID the pandemic is you are for me the Marina Abramovitz of what you do. The fact the artist is present, you know, the fact that you've been so present in your white blouse shirt, let's call it a shirt, mm. and your white earbuds and your incredibly beautiful face and talking to so many people. I don't, can I ask you a question first? Yes, please. Has this changed you? Go talking to so many people, have you, what's happened to you? There's yeah, hundreds and hundreds, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it really, I think it did change me. I think it radically changed me. I think uh, it will have a profound impact on my work. Also at the Siegel Center, we will engage in a different way. Also with the city, with others, and the way I think about life and art and making art and the significance actually of it also in the time we live in um, through this international talk and to, to listening and uh, I, I, I just watched that uh, documentary on CBGB, um, that, that great music club. And the guy who ran it said his, his mom would always say, uh, who in a Jewish old age home gave him the money to put down the, 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 the deposit. And he said, sometimes you have to listen to hear, you know? And, um, and I think um, something radically changed. And um, so um, thank you. And thank you, thank you for your, for your kind words. Um, but, um, and um, let's talk about- what, what, is that, what is that documentary on CBGB? I wanna see it. I, um, I it's a documentary CBGB. or a film, I think. It's called CBGB and- uh, It's called CBGB, okay. Yeah, uh, and, um, and it's, it's quite, a, quite a beautiful story. I like a little a rat hole, you know, which became so yeah. significant and so important in a way, you know, also following up on, on what you see. You do something with intention and openness and give space and uh, also leave space. Um, so that is um, of importance. So, and um, that's my old neighborhood, the CBGB oh, neighborhood. Yeah, oh, really? I lived all during the the eighties, uh, pretty much in the height. It was just like down the street. So, I got to watch that that film. So you saw many concerts there, I guess. I uh, went in a few times and smelled the beer, and you know, yeah, got pushed to the back. But it was yeah. the atmosphere and the energy around that building that was such a magnet, you know more than actually being in the building, just the fact of it existing, you know, where is CBGBs now, you know, in terms of our yeah. 2021 CBGBs, what does that mean? Yeah, where do we have an, a place where more energy comes out and radiates energy than it, than it yeah. um, comes in? So I, 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 uh, I read your book and, and thank you for, for sending it to me. And um, first of all, Anne is one of the few theater artists, uh, especially in America that also writes. Uh, in um, Europe, it's a bit more common. It's almost expected, but also people want to share what they do and what they think about here. People are still skeptical. People say something is academic and then it means it's something bad. Or, but Anne is someone who reflects. She has uh, uh, written uh, uh, books and her new one, The Art of Resonance, I think is a, is a very beautiful reflection, a meta reflection. And uh, she uh, is a theater philosopher in the way there are uh, sports philosophers or music philosophers. And the closest I could think of is uh, Patti Smith, uh, who um, writes about her work, about her life, about the time she was in, what's on her mind, and, and transcends the field of music where she comes from and gives us some guidance meanings beyond it. So um, that's uh, uh, something. And I wanted to say as a quote from your book, uh, uh, 
uh, Sabubona, if I say that right, uh, you write the Zulu in, uh, tribes uh, in South Africa say that instead of hello, it's I see you. So uh, I do see you. And uh, so uh, welcome on Siegel Talks. Thank you. And, and I, I can't think of a higher compliment than to be compared to Patti Smith, who's just the greatest human being I can think of. So thank you for that. And I would also say just the books that I've written, the books of essays, I'll tell you the secret behind them is I love telling stories because I figure you can learn more, you can learn something better if you learn it in the way the person who, who learned it learned it. Mm -hmm. In other words, if I tell you the story of how I learned something, I'm actually telling you the theory rather than telling you the theory, like mm -hmm. how it maybe changed me. So I started writing these books because I didn't want to tell the same stories over and over again in rehearsal or in classes. And so I made a promise after my first book of essays, which was called A Director Prepares, I made a promise that whatever I wrote about, I would never be able to tell those stories again. And so then a whole new bunch of stories come up and I have to write those. I break the rule all the time because, mm -hmm. hey, a lot of people don't read the books and I can tell the same stories. But it comes, the books come out of experience and wanting to spend time trying to understand the experience, how it's changed me, as I asked you, how has this work that you've done in the last two years changed you, and try to articulate what those changes are, sort of a, a way to force into being uh, an insight via a story of how I learned it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we learn we learn a little bit about you. You're, um, I think, it's more a reflection, actually, almost in a spiritual sense um, on um, being an artist uh, in a floating world, um, uh, in a fleeting world where we are in. And um, we do know a little bit. You're an army brat. I think you're, you're, you're your family. No, was, no, no. You got no, it wrong. for the navy. No, the I, navy. Thank you. Right. Uh, sorry, I'm the navy. Yes, from to the navy. Anyone in the army or the navy that they're the other they get really upset and and you got it wrong so you you should be you should be chastised for that yeah 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 it's the it's the uh, it's the navy and uh, you say you moved around a lot very early on you saw many places you also talk about you know what it means to speak in different languages having an awareness of different realities and um, as uh, going back to patty smith and her horses album you also you 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 loved horses right when you started out and um yeah, I, actually, I come from not only a Navy family, I come from a family of, for many, many generations of Navy. As a matter of fact, my great, great, great grandfather was captain of the Minutemen, was the, uh, yeah, that's how military my wow. family is. And all of my uncles were Naval officers, my father, my grandparents, uh, and all of the women in, in my family became naval officers' wives. That's what you did. You didn't join the Navy if you're a woman. You became a naval officer's wives. So, and, and, and my, my grandfather, whose name was uh, Admiral Spruance, he was in charge of the Pacific Fleet during the Second World War and is generally known for winning the Battle of Midway. <laughs> I mean, that's mm -hmm. how crazy uh, my, my crazy Navy, my family is. So coming out of that, background, uh, yes, I did not want to become a naval officer's wife. That was never appealing to me. I did fall in love with horses and, and I spent a lot of time training two-year-olds when I was 15 and 16 years old um, and showing horses as well. I was never great at it, but I loved, I loved the communication that you had with a horse. It was pretty spectacular, which is related in some ways to communication a director has with actors. I don't mean to say that actors are horses, but you communicate in ways that are not always with language. You communicate physically with, with each other. Even if you're not, if you, I'm off the stage, I'm in a big house and, and they're on the stage, they can feel um, the physicality of a director because I'm the first audience member. And so they need, they need that presence there. Mm -hmm. What was the exact moment when you said, I want to do a theater, that's my life? Um, well, you know, go moving every year. The longest place I lived growing up was in Japan for two and a half years. Most places were one year and I'd be plopped down into these big schools. And, and um, what I found was that, that there was a place in these big schools where something called theater was being made and you'd get really close to a, a bunch of people. I never wanted to act. I was, was, you know, 
assisting or pulling up the curtain or what have you, but you fall in love with a group of people, you have a really intense experience, and then it's over. And that felt my life, like my life. It felt like moving every year. So I could find a place where I could have intense, passionate relationships, and then it would be over and I'd move on. So that seemed fine. But when I really, really decided that directing, and I started directing as a, in high school, um, and, and um, I actually took over a, a production my, my French teacher was doing of the Ball Soprano by uh, Eugenio Nesco in 1965 in a school in Rhode Island called Middletown High School, which is a terrible high school, um, to actually um, be doing a French absurdist play. Um, uh, I was assisting and my French teacher got sick and she called me and she said, you have to take over. And so I had to figure out what I mean, usually in high school, we did plays like Charlie's Aunt or, mm -hmm. you know, um, Brigadoon. And it was really unusual to be, do, be doing a, a, a play by Ionesco, especially in 1965, when nobody knew about the theater of the absurd. I had to figure it out and, and all the right things happened. So I'd, I had a crush on the boy who was playing, um, uh, 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 his name was Jimmy Cometa, who was playing Mr. Smith. So that was good. And it was a success, even though it took place in a lunchroom. I don't know, many people grow up in this country doing theater in, in lunchrooms, because that's what high schools have. They call it cafetorium. And theater always cafetorium. smelled like lunch. Mm -hmm. You know, there was always one end of the cafeteria, there was a, a curtain and a flag, and you pull up the curtain, there's a little stage. And that's where we did theater, and that's where I did theater. But when I really decided was, um, it, in when I was 15, um, Adrian Hall had just taken over Trinity Repertory Theater in, in Providence, Rhode Island. And I was out in Middletown, Rhode Island. And he, he went to the NEA and uh, asked for a million dollars, which in 1967 was uh, like about a hundred million dollars now to bring every school kid in Rhode Island in to see theater. And so I was one of those school kids who was brought into Providence on a yellow school bus to see the Scottish play in a big auditorium. And it, the set was by Eugene Lee and who uh, was young then and, and Adrian Hall, the director and this incredible company. I didn't understand a word of it. I didn't understand Shakespeare. I'd never heard Shakespeare before. And the witches were coming out of the ceiling. It was a, a environmental production, thousand school kids. And at the end of that production, I sat there and I said, this is what I wanna do for the rest of my life, whatever that is. My whole body pointed towards the stage or the, the, the event of it. And it, it was the first lesson I ever learned as a director from Adrian Hall, although I didn't meet him till 25 years later, but which was don't talk down to your audience. In other words, he could have taken that million dollars and done, done any kind of kid's schlock, but he did a very complicated play. And I didn't understand the language and I, my whole 15 year old body was reaching towards the stage, trying to understand it. And I realized in that moment, and I've never forgotten it, is that theater isn't about understanding necessarily. It's about an experience of taking who you are at that time, bringing it to the stage, meeting the stage. And so that was the moment I decided that changed everything. That was what mm -hmm. I was gonna do for the rest of my life. It was this thing called directing. Incredible, yeah. That's that's good. That's a quite story. It reminds of that sentence someone said, you know, don't don't write what you know. Everybody tell it, write what you feel. You know? Yeah. So, and I guess, Definitely. and they also in 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 a, it's about what you feel, and we forget everything, but how may, people make you feel, and that's yeah. uh, what's what stays with us. We might forget what they have said. So, um, yeah. Uh, just a very few sentences for all of our listeners, also international listeners who might not know about, and she is one of the three co-artistic directors of the CT company, a very significant part of the landscape in New York City and of American um, theater, of a theater that is on the forefront. Um, you know, often, um, you, I know you don't like to be called experimental avant-garde director, but still at the forefront um, of theater that asks questions and asks more questions. And you have better questions after you saw that she uh, co-founded it with this significant, great, legendary Japanese theater director, Tadashi Suzuki. In 92, she's a professor at Columbia University where she runs the graduate directing program. And it's fair to say in the nation, in the Americas and also North America, you know, it's will be looked at by many as the most significant um, uh, school of uh, where understanding takes place when one talks about theater directing um, and, uh, and all that she 
has, I think, 50 productions at least, so it's impossible uh, to put them out. But the Bakai, Ch Chuck Me plays, the Hotel Kasupeya, the Scottish play, Noel Coward, uh, Orestes, and um, so many on, also a lot of opera work, as she talks about it also in the book. And she wrote five books, a director uh, prepares, the Viewpoint book, and this is something significant from the company, the Viewpoint idea, which she took and, uh, uh, and, um, and put it into a new form. And then your act, uh, conversations with Anne, and what's the story? So, um, and, and in the time of Corona, you wrote this book where we say, how is, what is artistic resonance and how can it be linked mm. to one's life and one's art? So tell us a bit. Yes. I used to think that the role of theater was to create memories. When I understood that from, from neuroscience that memory is actually a protein in the brain that, um, that is created in the heat of experience or emotion. So in other words, when we go to see a play, I'm sure both of us and everybody listening has has gone to a play and left and you don't remember anything. It's just gone and it becomes an insignificant event. But sometimes you go to, go to see productions and there are moments that linger for a long time. And what's happened in those moments is through emotion, you create literally a protein in the brain that is memory. And in order to access that, there are synaptical activities that happen. And as we learned that every time you access a memory, you change it. So long story to say that I thought that the theater was about creating memories. And as a matter of fact, I used to think that if theater were a verb, it would be to remember, to put things back together again. We remember people who've passed, stories that have passed, questions that are still important in our social system. So I thought, oh, that's what the theater is. Until my colleague, Leon Inglesrud, who's a co-artistic -artist, director of City Company, who's um, family was undergoing some issues with with alzheimer's he asked me a question he said what about somebody who can't remember what is the theater for them and that really stopped me in my tracks and i started thinking about books you know i read a lot i love reading but sometimes sometimes i'll read books that profoundly change me and yet two weeks later, I can't remember what it was or even the title. Somebody say, what was that book? And I can't remember the title of it. But I realized that what matters is not what I remember, but what happens in the moment of reading or the moment of experience when one is altered, that beautiful word metanoia, to be transformed by the experience of something. And so I suddenly went, well, maybe the theater is not so much about to remember, but it's about resonance. It's the resonance that occurs in the moment of the experience. So those resonating moments when I was reading changed me. I don't necessarily remember exactly what happened, but they, those moments altered who, who I am. So I decided because it was such a, a huge realization that the best thing to do would to write a book about it, it which meant that then I had to study resonance on a scientific level, on, especially in music, since resonance is so basic in music, had to reflect on it, think about it in relationship to one's life. And so a, a book about resonance seemed to be the right thing. And then along came the, the pandemic and suddenly I had time to sit down and do that. Um, I think I told you last time we were talking that um, I went to London to see my wife, Rena Fogel, who is um, hopefully listening right now. Um, uh, we, we share a home in London and in New York. I went to London for spring break on March 11th, 2020 with a small suitcase, expecting to stay for a week. And I stayed for a year and a half and uh, did all of my work both with City Company and Columbia on Zoom, as we all have experienced ad nauseum, I'm sure. But, um, and so it was time to actually put this book into, into action. And so uh, um, I was able to spend time writing and rewriting and rewriting and rethinking. So that is thanks to the pandemic, I would say. Mm. <clears throat> I, I really, uh, uh, um, 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 how do I say, not enjoyed, but I, it, uh, um, 
made an impression, you know, uh, on me to an impact. You're like sometimes there's like a in the printing idea, like a metal plate gets yeah. a piece of paper. There's some color in between, and then something says, "So you are an impressionist in that sense." Um, um, and uh, you're in this kind of philosophical, spiritual writing in a way that goes beyond, um, you know, just uh, this thing um, itself. You quote Einstein, who says, "Everything in life is vibration." Mm -hmm. You talk about energy, the idea um, of, of uh, wow. energy, and you say, my job as a director is to awaken resonant channels to others. Um, mm -hmm. So it, do it does feel, it's a di discovery you, you, um, you um, made, as you not just said, to started writing the book. Uh, what, what else, what surprised you in your time when you wrote, when you started re writing? Well, you know, in, in rehearsal, um, in City Company, we have a, a technique, which is called, called this. You, you start working on something and then you say, yeah, but what is it really? And just as you think that you realize what it really is, somebody will say in a very annoying way, but necessary way will say, yeah, 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 but what is it really? And then you work and you solve that. I guess it's called the hermeneutic process, you know, mm -hmm. you, 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 and you finally reach a resolution. And then you say, yes, but what is it? What are you really trying to say? Or what, you, and that process certainly um, happened writing this book, which is, you have to bring all the strands of your life. So you say there's spiritual strands or there's philosophical strands or scientific strands. So these are things that interest me. And so as in, in each topic or each chapter or each, even each paragraph, I have to say, you know, can I take it deeper? I think this is what it means, but what is it really? And that technique can make good theater, I know, which is a group attempting to constantly ask, oh, this is fine. We discovered this yesterday, but what is it really? I remember watching um, a, um, a documentary of the, uh, 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 the German, German painter, famous German painter, Big Washes of Richter. Color. Richter. Yeah, it's Richter, wonderful. Yeah. Have you seen that documentary yes. on him? And it's so fascinating because he comes into the studio every day and he looks at what he did the day before and then he obliterates it. You think, oh, wait, that was great what you just did. And then he paints over it. And then something glorious happens. And then he leaves, comes back the next day and you watch him looking at the, looking at the canvas. And then he calls for the paint and he just goes at it again. And that, that way of, of constantly asking, what, what is at the root of this? What are, what, are, what, are, what are you getting at? Or what is it really? And certainly studying resonance does require study because it's not something I had studied before. So there's many people who write or speak about resonance from different points of view. So I tried to bring all of those together into a book that's about the theater. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I... If you have your book close by, maybe now or later, maybe read us an, um, a, a paragraph um, of it. Uh, I don't know if you have something with you. Uh, well, you, you, you mm -hmm. emailed me at the last yeah. minute, so I pulled the book up and yes. I just pulled it to the end. So I have a couple yes. of things that come yeah. from the end of the book, if you'd like me to read. Yeah, read else. something so we hear your voice and your words. All right. I, I'll have two then. I'm gonna, one mm -hmm. is a little before the end, and then I'm going to read the end. So, yeah. But really, this is a little bit random, Frank, but yeah. I hope it's okay. Mm -hmm. So this is in a chapter called Dedication. I found that the greatest obstacle to dedication turns out to be myself, my fear of losing myself, my fear of failure or of things falling apart. How can I surrender myself when myself is perhaps simply the biological urge to hold on, to cling, to cling to life, to continue to survive? But by clinging to myself, I may strangle myself. I believe that an effective artist must have a huge ego and no ego simultaneously. The ego is meant to drive a stake into the ground and stay the course, stay committed, stay dedicated. But then no ego allows the music to flow and frees up actions that are in concert, ooh, that are in concert, sorry, somebody rang me, that are in concert. Mm, 
uh, here we are. But then no ego allows the music to flow and frees up actions that are in concert with the universe. In cultivating dedication, here's what I tell myself. Plunge headlong into what you're doing. Erase the boundaries. Let go. Start before you're ready. Starting creates momentum. There's always a reason not to begin, not to start, not to pull the trigger. But starting allows me to encounter the obstacles that will ultimately help me get out of my own way. Send whatever comes your way back out. Send it back out again, actively, muscularly, and with feeling. Dedicate. So that's a little excerpt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, we, we can hear uh, from you that it's almost, you know, like an uh, old instructional, no uh, family <laughs> writings, you know, that it is, it, it, it touches actually on life itself um, and goes beyond um, 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 the, what the, 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 the field. Um, well, I, tr I try to, Frank, to write from my own frailties and not from my strengths. In other words, if I write from my strengths, I sound pompous. Mm -hmm. But I try to get in touch with where I'm really not terribly sure, where I go wrong, I embarrass myself, and to write from that space, as opposed to pompously spouting theory, which I think is hard to read. So something yeah. is more readable if it's more personal, usually, I think. Yeah. So. yeah, and it's very, very open. And I mean, there, there are so many ideas uh, that come up almost, yeah, in kind of small paragraphs or aphorism or reflections, daily reflections you have. You know, one also you point out uh, the resonance and dissonance, you know, the, the, the um, yeah. relation. What, what, how do you see the relation between those? Well, you can't really... I've learned this. You cannot create or create the conditions for resonance without dis dissonance. In other words, you know, I love the German word, you'll have to um, translate it properly, which is auseinandersetzung. It's perfectly said, yeah. Which, if, you know, not correct my pronunciation, but rather the, it's hard mm -hmm. to define. If you look mm -hmm. the word auseinandersetzung up, in a dictionary, it would say disagreement or something, or argument. But in fact, the disease in the American theater is the disease of agreement, where there is no dissonance. We think a good rehearsal is where one where everybody agrees with each other, which I think is wrong. That the, the, the word in German, auseinandersetzung, which means to set yourself apart from each other in order to create. You don't mm -hmm. create by collapsing into each other. And so it's this dissonance among people which actually is the mo has the creative spark. So that misunderstanding the idea that if everybody's in agreement and everybody's happy, then something will happen. Resonance will not arise without dissonance. And so dissonance is like the, you know, the sand in the, in the oyster. It's, the, it's, the, it's what, what, what creates the pearl. It's the, it's the irritation. It's the, um, it's the things that are not quite right, that are wrong. You know, I, I, if the, um, the pottery that's beautiful because in the Japanese tradition, it has a flaw in it. And the flaw or the dissonance is what creates the beauty. So the, in, in writing a book on resonance, you have to include dissonance since dissonance is part of the um, ingredients to create or to create the conditions for resonance. And I say create the conditions for resonance rather than creating resonance, because I don't think you can create resonance. You have to be create the conditions in which resonance might occur, where the right in music, that the right notes counter to each other, create the condition for this, for this, for, for resonance. Yeah. So dissonance is, 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 is key. And I'm glad you brought it up, Frank. Yeah. yeah. I think you also, you quote uh, John Cage, who in like conversation, but not the idea of a debate, right? Uh, yeah. And, 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 and conversation is, is key. And he talks uh, two things about John Cage and also dissonance. One is, I think this one is fun, is that, you know, he lived on Sixth Avenue, uh, moved into Sixth Avenue. I don't remember what floor it was, around 14th Street, I think. 
And um, the traffic really annoyed him, the sounds of traffic, because it was really loud on Sixth Avenue, until he decided to, to, to change the way he listened to the traffic. And he decided then that traffic was more beautiful than Mozart. So it has to do with how you allow dissonance into your life. But the, the, the conversation part, as opposed to the debate, is very key in my own life, I think. I mean, we're having a conversation. And it means etymologically to turn with. Con is with, verse, versos, to turn with. So you and I are having a conversation. I hope at the end of the conversation, we've switched roles, that we've, we've turned around each other and that we have, we, we aren't debating. You and I are not debating. We're not saying I have this point of view, I have this one. We're together turning and attempting to create a resonant condition, which is, which is sacred actually. Mm -hmm. And that's John Cage. Thank you very much for bringing him up. <laughs> yeah, and in a way connected. I always say, that. when in doubt, when in doubt, John Cage. That's what I say. Yeah, good. So, uh, what would John Cage think, right? Okay. What would John so, Cage yeah. think? Yeah, yeah. Um, like uh, Billy Wilder, the movie director, suppose he had. What would uh, Ernst Lubitsch do? You know, he was on his yeah, big right. <laughs> over his door. Um, and and uh, yeah, but I think what you talk about this. I apparently, I got. Apparently, Bill T. Jones once went into a rehearsal. I think it was for Spring Awakening, and he was trying to figure out how to work on the choreography. And he said out loud, "He said, what would Bill T. Jones do?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's even that is even better. But what you describe that idea of the conversation um, is also what theater is about. You know um, that you have this agonism. You know, you have a, you have a, a competitive uh, uh, um, uh, parallel uh, stream of arguments to understand the complexity of the world, but you debate it and you leave also things um, open. I mean, you you talk about yeah. the void. But what does that mean, the void, the silence, in, in, um, in the way philosophically for you, but also in your theater yeah. work? You know, there was, um, I work a lot, we've worked with a group called Rachel's, the Rachel's, they don't exist anymore as a, as a, as a music group before. They work with uh, City Company a lot. And one of the musicians, Christian uh, Fredrickson, is a wonderful violist and also just a composer. Um, he plays music during the viewpoint sessions uh, with us. And at one point I asked him, I said, how do you know when to enter? How do you know when to join when there's maybe 15 actors on the stage? And how do you know what sounds to interject? And he said, I look for the empty spaces. I look for where there's not something. And I think that in general, the void, we tend to want to fill the void, but to actually not is to look for the spaces where there isn't something and to um also the void means making space for the audience in other words we tend to in the theater to want to do everything for the audience but if you start saying what is the audience's job you have to create space for them which is a kind of void you have to create space in the staging so that you do the least you can do so that the audience does the most and the void is about about realizing that in the creation of resonance, it's not just about filling space, it's also creating a void inside of space, inside of the, 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 uh, the moments of being. And that in those spaces, when you can stop together, that's again, to use that overused word is, is sacred. It's a sacred moment when the audience and the, and the actors come together in a moment and everything stops. And it's only created by an attention to the void in any moment of rehearsal. Sometimes also, if I'm working uh, on a scene as a director and the, uh, there's a particular actor who has a very, very big monologue or something, I will pay attention to everything but that actor to give them space, to put a void around them so they can do their work. So I'll spend a lot of time, if you were watching me direct, you're saying, why isn't Anne paying attention to the actor who's doing the big monologue? She's paying attention to like how the three people around that person are holding a stick or something, whatever it is. But it's because I'm trying to create space. If I'm micromanaging, then there's no void, there's no space. Actors have to make space for each other too looking for the void, looking for the space where there's not. Um, creating empty spaces is as important as creating things. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, you, you, you talk about the present moment, uh, um, the, the, the moment of being, you called Virginia Woolf or Harold Bloom, the, the privileged moment, you know, which is so true in, in theater. But I, yeah, I like I your idea it, of the privileged moment, how you, how yeah. you transferred it from poetry. To... Yeah, you know, it's so interesting uh, that you bring that up because we live in a, in a time where the word privilege is very suspect and for good reason. In other words, to be privileged is something that we all need to be aware of, the privilege of being able to speak. So I had an issue with that. I love that phrase, which is the privileged mm -hmm. moment, which, as you say, both Harold Bloom and the glorious and one singular Virginia Woolf use that phrase. The privileged moment is a moment that um, is unlike anything else. I remember the first time when I was a teenager, I read um, To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. And I'll never forget the experience because it informed this idea of the privilege moment and pretty much everything I do as a director, which is you read To the Lighthouse, you're reading about this family and this trip to the lighthouse and it gathers, the story gathers and gathers with her incredible Virginia Woolf's extraordinary language. And she takes you to a place and she took me as a 15 or 16 year old to a place. She lifted me up like this and then she let go of me. And I had this experience of falling and it, she brought me there through words. And whatever that experience was, is what I've been looking for my entire life in the theater. That sense of coming to a place with an audience and then letting it go and just, just um, um, the, the sense of time and space changes. There's no future, there's no past, there's the present. There's, the, it always comes down to what is the least you can do? What, can you get to a moment where you do almost nothing on the stage and the audience is doing it all? I'm thinking of an example of um, the, 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 the Peter Brooks production of, the, of Carmen, the, the opera, which he turned yeah, into a chamber I saw opera. That, yeah. and, well, you remember the last moment is Don Jose is going to kill Carmen. And he lifts and he lifts, and there's been no blackouts or anything for the whole time. He lifts the dagger and he makes a gesture and the first blackout and the end of the, of the, of the experience happens with this gesture, with just that, and the lights go out. So what happens is he never stabs her, but the audience does it. That moment where you, bring it over that you you let go of controlling the stage and the imagination flows and time flows and i don't know if you remember that moment frank but yeah i do it was that, that it beautiful was, circle also you know with such yeah. few actors so con it was a, it was truly a magical thing to be all what, yeah. i mean you write about it in your book where you say actually as your introduction you said it's not about creating a memory about communicate communicating something you say Art sobers and quiets the mind, and you open it up to perhaps have this kind of divine uh, uh, realization or an influence that you have that moment. Yeah. Um, you talk that is bigger than all of us, but it's so connected to our lives, and uh, it rarely happens. Like yeah. sometimes it does in sports, you know, where something yeah. you cannot believe what had just happened, you know, and. Yeah. Um, but it makes us alive, understand life, the complexities of it, and um, and um, and uh, you you really um, drive that home. And I think this is such an important lesson. What is it all about, really? You know. And isn't isn't that what you just described worth an entire life of research to find that moment or find those moments? That is what one for me to dedicate oneself to that is enough. You know, that's, that's quite extraordinary. You know, we're right now in rehearsal up at um, the Fisher Center at Bard. We're doing a production of, um, and nobody can believe it when I say it, we're doing a Christmas Carol. I know every mm -hmm. time I say that people roll their eyes, we're but it's radio Christmas Carol. And this is about subjects that we're embarrassed to talk about, you know, uh, uh, redemption, um, change the the a character like scrooge who's been so tight-fisted and isolated who turns 
turns toward the light, changes life. I forgot how I got onto this. What were you just talking about, Frank? Well, it that divine really... moment, you know, that moment of a realization yeah. of a bigger truth, you know, or yes, which, was, exactly. which cannot be expressed in words in a way, you know, and even yep. in the painting, you know. Yeah, exactly. And there is, there's a the beautiful word that I learned recently called, as I mentioned it a little bit earlier, which is metanoia, which means to change direction. And it's those moments you have that you just described when you're reading or experiencing a play or a piece of music where everything just opens up. And it means to turn towards the light in a sense. It's, um, and it's, it's different. And, and, and I think Scrooge goes through it. Uh, 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 it's not repentance. Repentance is something quite else where you say, oh, I was bad. But no, you turn and suddenly you see everything in a new light. And that moment, that little turn is, is to use the word for the third time in this hour, sacred. It's a sacred, um, a sacred moment, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I like also how you connected that idea of um, the energy, that moment also to sports and... Uh, you say, you know, acting is a, is a sport, you know, you said there's a quality to an energy. I know you, you did Aikido and you do Tai Chi and, um, and that, that taught you, um, you know, to be present, but not to do, yeah. to do, you to do, know. To do, the, to do the not to do, my Tai Chi master used to say, to do the, to do the not to do, do the never mind, do the good job, <laughs> to actively not do, which is a whole art in itself. But also, I mean, as you say, acting, you know, there's, it's been, it's been proven scientifically that an actor speaking a monologue in front of an audience is under more stress than an Olympic high jumper just before jumping. That it is such a stressful moment to be in front of an, an audience, to line oneself up in that way. So in that sense, it is athletic and it requires a great deal of training and practice and dedication. Um, and so in that sense, there are these alignments between what athletes do and certainly what actors do, particularly in the theater, yeah. on a stage, on a big stage, with a big audience, which is yeah. extraordinary. Yeah, yeah and how, how strong these actors really, really are, and you compare them to quarterbacks, actually, you know, who yeah. decide the game, have to hold the tension, have to hold the company, and also... As you say, Suzuki said that you know, be a role model outside. You know, as we experience yeah. to be a leader off the field. And when you're yeah. at it, there is something magical. You know, in sports, you have a little white line, and people sit on the bench and wait, and then they you up, and then they go in, and then they are present. You know, they play, and then if they get called off, they cross the line, and then they go back in their normal lives. You know, like in theater <laughs> too, you you kind of you jump in there and. Um, and you, you, you share, and as you say, it's so vulnerable, you're open to failure, and everybody makes such a big fuss about a touchdown or this or that, which I like, but they, what actors do, what directors do to prepare them, it is uh, really uh, beyond a graft. It is an art, um, yeah. um, as you said. You also said, you know, theater's only as good as its execution, which I also like. It's not good enough that you have the idea and you explain it, you know, you have to do it. Yeah, I, I've always, loved uh, something Picasso said, which has given me a great deal of agency. So I hope it's useful to anybody who's listening. It'll, it's such a freeing notion. He said that the first stroke on the canvas is always a mistake. And the rest of the work on the canvas is to fix that mistake. I find that absolutely freeing. That what keeps us from actually putting a stroke on the canvas is we, we feel like we don't know, we don't know enough, or how can we possibly yeah. make a staging decision or something? But if we understand that it's gonna be a mistake, whatever we do, no matter how long we've prepared, it's, it's gonna be a big fat mistake. And then we just work on it and work on it and keep bringing ourselves back to it. And, um, and so in that sense, it is execution and it requires courage to act without knowing the answer, to act without having a psychological reason that this thing should happen to, you know, I was really surprised years ago, um, uh, uh, Richard Foreman came to speak to my directing students and Richard Foreman, who in my mind is the most, and you know, you've done talks with him, Frank, but he's the, one of the most intellectual directors on the planet, I think. And he said to the students, to the directing students, he said, directing is 100% intuitive. 
And to hear from that from him to say that is was was very freeing. And so I, I feel like study is important before and after a rehearsal. But in rehearsal, it has no place. Say if I spend two months preparing to direct a play, that preparation only allows, gives me the permission to go in the door to the rehearsal and shut the rehearsal door. From then on, it's intuitive. After rehearsal, I am obliged to think and study and use my rational brain, but in rehearsal, it, it, you can't drag your research into rehearsal. So it becomes about execution. It comes about painting or uh, uh, um, uh, making decisions that are, are based on the feelings rather than the intellect. Hmm. I think you're buoyed by your study and certainly it's in there, but you can't bring it in and say, this is why you should cross stage left. No, that's not right. Mm -hmm. It is execution and execution is a violent word, a very violent word, but I think making art is somewhat violent anyway, because once you make a decision about something, you've cut out 362 other possible decisions. And it's a very violent Mm -hmm. thing to do. Or if an actor has a beautiful moment, and you as a director, you come up and say, that was great, keep that. It's like, I've got a dagger and I'm stabbing that actor. Like keep it, because they know the next time they do it, it's gonna suck. They know that they have to resurrect what has been sacked. You know, that's why actors for me are heroes, that they, you, you, you execute their decision by saying, their, their choice by saying, keep that choice. And then they have to go through a process of, uh, of resurrecting what's been killed. Mm-hmm. And you then know, it I, starts to become art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean the, the, the violence you just mentioned. I, I remember the passage in your work where you said, I was once involved in Berlin in an exercise and was had three parts. We were blindfolded. And then we, you know, once uh, we were put around, uh, someone guided me, then someone was beaten, you know, who the blindfolded. And then you were comforted. Oh, the Germans. The Germans, yeah. This kind of, you know, thing that they say, I was su- surprised, you know, what's inside us, the dark. You say, you, you, you quote Carl Jung and say, no tree can grow to heaven unless its roots uh, reach down to hell. And I didn't know that. Yeah. And this goes with what you say, the actor who, you know, in a way, is, it's, it's a violent uh, yeah. uh, 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 sport, you know, what we see on yeah. stage. And people yeah. forget. It's not about, as you point out, and I like that in your book, you say this is not about entertainment or just entertainment. It's not about communicating you want to disrupt, you want to destabilize, yeah. you investigate, you research, and you want transformation and reorganization. I'll, I'll, I'll quote you from yeah. that, that's your quote, yeah. which is a, a very significant and important uh, uh, statement, especially in America. You know, it was, um, I was at a uh, holiday party for City Company with board and company a number of years ago, and one of our board members who's was, um, he's not on our board anymore, but he was, his specialty is PR and branding. And he kept saying to me, and if you could put, if you could put what you're doing in the theater into like a phrase that I could tell my friends, maybe they'd come and see your shows, you know, like give me something. And I, I kept saying, I don't remember what I said, but it was unsatisfying to him. Like I would say, you know, I don't remember what I first said, but when I finally said, Jason, it's a gym for the soul. And he said, oh, I, I get that. That's great. And I think it is. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 a, it's a place that we go to work out, but it's a gym for the soul. It's not necessarily one for the body, but it's for the soul to, 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 to spar and play and, and, and try out ideas and try things on um, for audiences. Mm-hmm. It's a gym for the soul. Yeah, that's a beautiful a uh, beautiful image. Also, it means you have to constantly do it, right? You have to go back to the gym. It's not that you went once the and then time. it's done. Yeah. You go yeah. for the actors, but also for audiences, you know, like yeah. in sports where people go and watch plays. And I couldn't, I mean, I didn't know anything about baseball. And then I would be in Yankee Stadium. People say, oh, that's a curveball. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, you're like so far away, but they know, you know. Yeah. And yeah. the beauty of it, or something goes wrong, and it also it's okay that it go. Not every game is great. Sport people don't have any yeah. problems with, but sometimes there's the great play, the great game, and the great moment, and that lives forever um, in um, in memory. Um, 
I like but that's so but mm -hmm. that's so interesting though, right? I mean, what does that mean? It's so important. Theater comes out of high school theater, you know, out of amateur mm -hmm. theater, out of people entertaining each other. And that the it's so interesting what you bring up that we have to we have to practice it all the time. And if we fall out of practice, you know, why are we so ill at ease right now in the world? Because we after the pandemic, after so much lockdown and isolation it's 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 awkward to be with one one another we have to practice being together and practice the art mm -hmm. of performance and the art of being an audience and it's so interesting and it starts as a kid you know it started for me being taken on a bus to see theater every school kid in rhode island brought to see theater in providence you know that practice if it's not instilled early is hard to pick up on you have to be in the in the flow of it Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's really true, and to be um, it has to be early on that is significant. Everybody we speak to was in a high school production or yeah. school production, yeah. or some some or parents yes. took them, and um, the significance of it. And but I also like uh, what you wrote about that you say where you are is okay. Replace where you are. Cast down your your bucket. Mm. You know, think about you know how can you do best you, you you talk about your colleagues and you you know it was not easy and we have heard that from emily mann and carrie perloff emily mann especially you know who was pushed up against the wall and yelled at you're a housewife and oh. uh, you will never be a director and they said women she was a directing student and her instructors all male not one woman would say you know uh you can do children's theater. What do you, what do you, why do you even study here? You know, um, mm. so I know you also, you created ways through the back door. You said that you said you have to put down your bucket. And I, uh, was that easy for you? How did you, what, what, when was the moment when you said, I cast down my bucket, this is what I'm going to do, do the company or what, when, what, when was that? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'll get right to that, but let me start by saying, I realized this cast down your bucket thing when I was on a panel in, in Maryland uh, after doing our show um, Room, which is about uh, Virginia Woolf. And I was on a panel with Molly Smith, uh, who was is the artistic director of the Arena Stage, and Tina Packer, who founded the uh, Shakespeare and Company in Western Massachusetts, and me. And I realized we, the three of us sitting on the stage had all gone through the back door to get to the front. Um, Tina Packer had been part of the Royal Shakespeare Company, which was a boys club, and she couldn't stand it. She left the UK, came to the States and founded Shakespeare and Company, which is now a very successful, obviously, company in Western Massachusetts. Uh, Molly, similarly, she finished studying directing in Washington and she uh, went up to Alaska, where nobody had theater in, in, um, in uh, Juneau, Alaska, and from nothing, she started the Perseverance Theater, which is the most successful theater in Alaska, and with her appetite. And I realized for myself, to answer your question, um, I, I, you know, I came to New York, downtown New York, around the corner from CBGB's and, you know, that area. And so I was very much a downtown person. And I, I knew that the corporate ladder was not for women. It was for men at the time. And there was a corporate ladder for directing that I could not bear the thought of even trying to go up it because for reasons that Emily Mann described because it's not it was not done. And so I just started making theater in where I lived. And I tried for a long time to get a theater to let me come in. I just had a you know, college resume of theater production. You went to Bard College, I, right? I went to four undergraduates. Four. I, Bard was my last and oh. my happiest. Um, that's a whole nother story, Frank, that could take an hour. But mm -hmm. anyway, I, then I came to New York. So I started doing work since I couldn't get a theater, you know, in streets and lofts and rooftops. And it was by putting my bucket down where I, are, I am, which sounds contradictory about going through the back door to get to the front. But all both, you know, Tina Packer and, 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 and Molly Smith and I all put our buckets down. And in the back door, we started working and all three of us moved to the front door that way, as opposed to trying to knock on a door that was inaccessible to all three of us. And so for me, that just meant make your work, get an audience to come and see it and just make another one and then make another one. And for years, I kept thinking to myself, because I had the 
weirdest, I had many odd, odd jobs before I started teaching at NYU, which was great at the experimental theater wing in the, in the I started in 79, um, in my twenties, that was very helpful because I started to use my paychecks to produce the shows. But every year I would think I can't self-produce anymore. I just can't do it anymore. But um, uh, uh, that was, the, that's the way it happened. And, and it, I think it's because of that, that whatever the kind of work I do has substance because I didn't try to go up the corporate ladder. I just made work where I was and started letting the influences, which as you know, Frank was, I was very influenced by the, the, the theater in Germany in the eighties had a huge influence. I mean, I tried yeah. to take those ideas and put them Kruber, you where about, I was. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. And Stein, of course, Stein. and Bondi and all those people. Uh, Gruber mm -hmm. the most, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's Bakai, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I did. Did you see that? His production I saw it on video Bakai? once, yeah. Yeah, yeah I saw it on video stunning. too. But that, I, yeah, yeah. No, I did not. I wish, I really wish I had seen that incredible yeah. production and um, what it means. And that's, yeah. talk about inscrutable. I mean, I only saw the video, but I've seen many of Groover's work before he died, but that video of the Bakai, talk about inscrutable. Nobody knows what, what it means. You can't say, yeah. you, you can't really analyze that production, but it's yeah. unforgettable. And I find with his work in general, every show that I saw is indelibly memories are planted in me deep deep, deep memories. And I don't know what it is he did. Yeah, yeah. I remember once I saw, just for fun, I guess, he took a farce, a very simple play, and just said, let me show you what you're going to, and he, it was at the Schaubühner, and it was the most mysterious thing he pulled out of it, what, something under it, <laughs> between the words, it was spellbinding. Amazing. You could not believe your eyes or your ears. It, this is what's happening, you know, and he, yeah. the, the distance between what he did and uh, what he remixed and uh, in kind of a f new forms. And I think you you talk about this. Is I like that your whole uh, the chapter on the power of threes in a way the the <laughs> triads you call them um, and one is um, which I think is important uh, for everybody also to listen and to hear it also from someone like you the idea of copy transform and uh, combine. combine. And combine. Yeah. You know, so I think that's an important uh, uh, um, a lesson. It that is one. I think I'm so glad you brought it up, Frank, because it's it is a really important lesson, and it comes uh, from a guy whose name I forgot. It's in the book. Um, uh, who's Kirby Ferguson? Who, yes, thank you. Sir. Thank you. Who is involved in all kinds of techno making, and 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 certainly uh, music and. And his idea is that you create through a three-part process. First, you copy. Then you uh, transform what you copy. And then you combine it with other things. So um, I think, who was the author who, who actually copied uh, uh, The Great Gatsby by Fitzgerald so that he could learn how to write a book? So you copy and then you enter into what you've copied. You know, apparently um, a, a typewriter was created mm -hmm. from a piano. You know, mm -hmm. you copy something, then you transform it. And then you take all the other things that you've been working on and you combine it. And suddenly you have something brand new. We don't create from not nothing. We create from the, the um, what we've been given, what we've been exposed to, what we've heard, what we've read, what we've seen. And the freedom to copy and then transform and then combine is a is a, a beautiful formula, and I think should be talked about more. Which is why I wrote yeah, about and it, also so. encourage that it's nothing bad, it's nothing wrong to yeah. take. And I, you know, the German painters went to Italy, you know, uh, yeah. to be inspired. You know, the German then performance artists went to New York to learn from the Wooster, from from your work and everyone, yeah. and that. And then you, but you transform, and or, or you say you you call. You quote Jasper Jones, take an object, do something to it, and, and do something else to it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so to, Jones. To, to really uh, change it, I think this is something um, uh, um, uh, of, um, of, of significance, you know, in the creation. I had a friend also, he was a teacher of um, screenwriting in Baconsfield, the most probably the most significant in the UK school where 
it is really also connected to the business. And he said to his first class students also, he said, well, I want you to just type up some uh, screenplays. You know, they would all come in with their ideas. That's and he said, funny. Well, yeah. I want you to type up a Billy Wilder or, you know, a, yeah. a Lutsky That's or something. That's so great. And That's they so were great. upset. And yeah. he said, no, you see how it, how it is at the moment, copy, you know, learn the technique. How does it look like the spacing? Yeah. And yeah. it's going to teach you something. It slows you down, which you also actually also um, talk about the idea, you know, of slowing yeah. down. I remember in our Siegel talk, you said, slow the fuck down, everyone. And that's what we are doing now. You were in London, I guess, writing this, yeah. this beautiful I think that came out of the question, question what have you learned? And the, yeah. what I learned was slow mm -hmm. the fuck down. Yeah. Did you slow down? And no? Also? I did. I, I did. I mean, I was on far too much Zoom because of teaching and working with City Company was all on Zoom, which was brain frying as I can only imagine you know more better than anybody in the yeah. world. But, um, but I was able to slow down and, and um, be with Rena and with the, our dog, Mabel, and um, take walks in Kensington Gardens every day. And it was great. It was important. I just hope we don't lose that. Mm -hmm. Did did it inform your book? It would have been, besides the fact that you had the time, of course you said that, but do you feel there is um, something in it of that time of Corona? I do. I can't say exactly how, although because spending so much time with my wife, Rena, who's really a wonderful writer and editor, she would look at what I wrote and she would always say to me, what is it really? I mean, she was an intolerant mm -hmm dissonant influence in my writing. So being with her and so close to her and her being impatient when I get cliche or pompous or anything like that was very helpful. I, I, I think the answer is yes, I can't say exactly how. I certainly, when you mention it, I can feel that year of being there in London and being in lockdown, I, I feel it. I feel what that was like. Mm. Yeah, something came on the bank accounts of, uh, you know, of being with oneself. And there's a question, uh, I mean, the Tai Chi, the Aikido, the directing, or it's in a way also a very personal experience. How do you combine it with the civic duties, you know, um, of, of the arts? How do you, what is the responsible at the moment? What do you think? What's, where's the place for art and theater at the moment? Probably more, significant than ever before. First of all, the, for me, the, the study, particularly now of Tai Chi and in the past of Aikido and um, martial arts, certainly, and, and um, you have to have a platform to stand on, which is a personal one. That is something that happens daily that you stand upon. So for me, it's a physical practice, um, practice of breathing properly. And once that's established, then you say, I have something to stand on. But I think the um, importance of theater people, myself and others, to stand up straight, to speak full sentences, to uh, articulate um, in the face of all of the ambu ambiguity we're living through, to be very clear in the face of ambiguity, and to be also clear about our role you know, in, in, in the world, I think that we've inherited due to political reasons that date back to the founding of, the, 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 of this country and also the McCarthy era, we have been turned uh, as artists into people with bad postures who are uh, uh, ashamed and, and, and asking for alms, you know, with shame. We actually need to develop our posture to be, um, articulate as we can to finish our sentences and to be able to, to point to and say why the theater is pivotal and why, as we were speaking earlier, that high schools need theater, that, that, um, that theater is a pivotal part of being human. The act of being an audience or being an actor, the act of, of, of participating on the, on the world stage is key. And I think we, we need to, take responsibility for our place in the world mm -hmm. but you have to have a platform to stand on a personal one, I think, so. yeah, yeah. I like yeah. that, to combine that yeah 
But I like yeah. that you, you, you pointed out that there is, and you call it intentional civics, you know, that there has to be an intention, but you have to be, to participate in this civilized yeah. world and that it's yeah. work by actors, um, you know, directors, uh, costume makers, the light designers, everybody, you know, is in a way participating. And if theater, I also think always if it's great, because it's a model for something. It's a place where people really do yes. talk, yeah. really yeah. do talk to each other. Yeah, yeah. And they do come to agreements in a very diverse group, you know, perhaps. And I think yeah. Katanya pointed it out in her book. We talked about, you know, sports, you know, groups and maybe at universities are as diverse, uh, but it's only theater although next to it, you know, where people come yeah. together and cre yeah. create something, what you can watch and uh, share. Yeah. Um, and um, and that there is um, um, a civic duty. Uh, and I the, love the, I, I do like the combination of the words intentional civics, which I didn't come up with. Which, yeah, I've never heard that, yeah. Yeah, actually, I, I was talking about politics. At, I was talking to a group pre-COVID pre of undergraduates at the New School, and I kept talking about theater and politics, and this young man stood up and he said, you should use the words intentional civics. And I was gobsmacked and I said what do you mean by that and he said intentional civics is where you pay pay attention not so much to the people but to the space in between them I found that profound that you t pay attention to the whole you t pay attention to the to the space in between and what I like about intentional civics it can exist on a on a very large scale but it can exist on how you move through the day that your intentional civics of how you pass somebody on the street or how you encounter someone or how you go to the grocery store, you can practice intentional civics every day in every waking moment, actually. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful notion. I asked him if he had invented the term, he said, yes. And I asked him what he was gonna do after he graduated, he was senior. He said, I was gonna go to grad school and, uh, but he wanted to, take intentional civics further and I said you're going to have to invent it yourself you know so yeah. I hope he has yeah he has to cast down his his own bucket yeah bucket that, where that, he that is, is true. Yeah. yeah I mean yeah. that's that is amazing you know and that civic duty and the closeness to it and you like in the old Greek at least or our fantasy of the Greek theater what it was and you so often quote them as your um as your um, defenders and uh, role models you know that yeah. the actor actually is like the goat that's being sacrificed is the matter. Yeah. You know, something happens in yeah. front of you, they do the yeah. sacrifice that the audience gets back or that catharsis um, yeah. um, can, can happen and, um, and that there is a role for it to play. And it's ancient. It has been with us for thousands of years. And as long as humans yeah. exist, it will be part of it. It's uh, perhaps the most human art form and older perhaps, you know, who knows, than painting books definitely of, and, and many other forms. Um, just one question. And can I, I add? Yeah. Can mm -hmm. I add that the, the, when you say many other forms, I have to say that through the pandemic, you have created a forum to keep things going in the theater. I think what you're doing in terms of conversations, mm -hmm. I just Thank have you. to throw that in there. No, that's really, really great. But yeah, theater is such an old art form. I once read an interview with Umberto Eco, and they asked him, "What do you think about you, the Kindle and the iPads and this? Isn't that you know against the book?" And he says, "Yeah, it's something we have to think about, but." Let's be honest, it's not so old, the invention of the book, you know, uh, it's, you have to see it in perspective, you know, so of yeah. course it's, it, it will change. But I had a, a question because it kind of said with me, you say, I don't like masks, you said, you talk about Greek theater, you say, so I, I found that interesting comment. So t tell a little bit about, about that. Why, since someone who also interprets and reawakens and resonates yeah. with the Greeks, what's the, why, why not? I understand why people love masks. I understand it in terms of what the Greeks were doing. You know, the fact that the fact that that the that, that Dionysus had a mask, a smiling mask, which seemed friendly at the first, but by the end it's terrifying. I understand that. I also understand why actors love doing mask work because it frees their bodies. I mm -hmm. love the human face. I think it's the most beautiful thing, and I don't like to hide it. I think on the on the stage, it's such a gorgeous place to go to. So, I I, I am a little intolerant of masks. I didn't go see um, Sleep No More because I don't want to wear a mask. 
I just don't like masks. I, 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 I am busy. There's two things I really abhor. One is chewing gum and the other is masks. Well, that's, uh, that's quite interesting. It's so visceral. How, how, yeah. <laughs> it's, how, do you, how do you deal then wearing a mask? How do you do it in rehearsals and with students at the moment? How, how is that? All I about? don't. I don't come anywhere near masks. No masks. <laughs> No Maybe it's wow. it's an intolerance I have to look at. I don't know. I just yeah. love the human wow. face. I like to see faces. Yeah, 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 yeah. You 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 quote Suzuki who says the good face, right? That yeah, the good face, yeah. which is also the Buddha is that way too, right? Which has a little smile, which means a completely relaxed face. Before you, as an actor, you put on a face, you have to relax it. And then from the emotions or whatever's coming through the body, the face <clears throat> makes, does something. It's not imposed upon it. And so um, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. If you think of Pina Bausch's company, mm -hmm. don't you remember that they all seem to have this little smile? It's so engaging. It's from a relaxed being, a little smile comes. That's where the Buddha gets the smile. From a relaxed state, a little smile occurs. I love that smile. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes it transfers to the audience, even so it's such a rigorous and often then violent uh, experience. Yeah. And that's quite, yeah. quite a paradox and interesting. Yeah. And uh, as you say, it's part of the unexplainable and all good art in a way is unexplainable because if you yeah. could explain it, why, why do it? You know, you, you just tell someone yeah. or you write it down. It's yeah. incredible. I mean, there's so much we haven't uh, talked about it. The, your Buddhist concept. But can I some, say you're, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm so, I'm so grateful that you read the book so clearly, uh, so, so well. So thank you for your amazing. Well, no, I, it was really uh, in, in inspiring, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that how you call this kanda, you know, the, the, the yeah. The ideas, you know, um, uh, of Abi Sabi, Leonard Cohen's cracks and the pottery, you know, Voltaire's the enemy of the good is the perfection, you know, um, and, uh, and 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 so so many many others. But I think um, we touched um, here on um, on the yeah. essence of it, and we can only give an idea for the real experience of it, as Anne said, as she read books and in that moment of reading when you also read a word, it's let's say tree, what she talked about, when you have to decide yourself, well, how does the tree look like as the reader, right? You have, it, it's yeah, work, yeah. but something happens in that moment and you transform the book into something and you're part of the transformation you come out. And I think that happened with me also reading your, your beautiful reflections, your philosophical reflections and life affirming one. And also wonderful that as a member of our trade you know of our uh, field you know that to that books like these emerge and um and it's a great uh, testimony i think you you also quote ariam nushkin who says you know to our actors before performances tonight could be someone in the audience who sees a play for the very first time could be the 15 year old and can also be someone who will never ever see a play again maybe the last time and keep it in mind and i think your whole book uh, shows the respect uh, towards your field your craft in the art uh, of theater of resonate, resonating, you know, that you say so much goes into it and then you produce something that um, comes out and how, um, how, how important that is for you and it really shines. So, so really, thank you, thank you. And I know we got you out of rehearsal. You could eat a few potato chips uh, uh, in between <laughs> sessions. So thank you. Thank and you. it's great that Rina could watch us. And um, so yeah. we didn't see your dog <laughs> this time. <laughs> That's too bad. And, um, and uh, I think it was truly um, a, a, a talk where understanding took place. And we know a little bit more um, than we knew before. We really learned something, or I did. And um, for our audiences, um, a chapter, her introduction actually is on our Google Drive. If you got the invitation by mail, we have from all our writers a chapter for free you know, in there, you can look around and read from N. Catania and Bonnie Maranca and Alexis Green and Teresa Smalek about Ron Water and the Wooster Group and all of it. And, and so there's something beautiful. And I really would encourage you go out and support writers, authors. These are important books. Go to your local bookstore, the drama bookshop and, um, and uh, engage and uh, compare to a, a bad salad, which you sometimes get in New York. The book you will have, if you like it, you will have it forever. 
We're going to continue um, this week with uh, Avra Sirdulupulu and Frank Radatz. They are both from Greece and Germany, and they talk about staging 21st century tragedies, like the tragedies we are going through. How do we stage them? Are they contemporary plays? Or do we go to the Greeks? If we do, how do we connect to it? And they and uh, and Avra uh, worked with 25 uh, uh, theater artists, and they all wrote essays. It's a fantastic book. And Frank Ravats from the Humboldt University will talk about his uh, uh, his new center, which he uh, created at that new age, which he feels we are entering in. And then Aiko will talk about uh, her experience, a buddy in Fukushima. Um, she took photos over years, went back many, many times uh, with her photographer, and she wrote small essays and reflections on a landscape that will be devastated for the next 800 years. And where does the body come in, performance and theater and art in the face of it? Um, and so we will hear from you. She's in Japan. We, as I said, we already heard from Bonnie Maranka, Teresa Smalek, uh, Alexis Green, Emily Mann, Carrie Perloff about her work with Pinter and Stoppard and 30 years in San Francisco and uh, in Catania um, last week with the art. The Moth Dramaturgy, also a very significant book where she actually uh, thanked you and said you helped her to connect uh, to a publisher um, for, for, her, for her work. So again, thanks to HowlRound for hosting us, uh, BJ and Thea. This is really a great honor and privilege, a privileged moment, I would say, in the sense and talked about for us to have such conversations. And of course, to our audiences, I know how much is out there, how busy life got again, but we know uh, people are listening to it all around the world, actually. And, um, and it is important to read books, important to write books, and it's important with intention then also to take actions and, uh, and be inspired. So Anne, I hope you uh, will have now time for uh, uh, something to eat. Or are you going to direct right away now? What's, how is your day going to look? Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing my class, final class at um, uh -huh. Columbia. Then I'm running back up to Bard College Fisher Center to rehearse. So Incredible. Incredible. So yeah. it's a long day. So in, when will the day be over for you tonight? When are you tonight, going to go home? 10 o'clock. Incredible, incredible. Well, it uh, just shows how much really goes in it. So thank you again and being so generous uh, for sharing your time, also the excerpt from your book. And, um, and really, we have our highest respect for your work in the theater, for the field. It's a work of decades, you know, you have put in and we are very, you know, I think we all are privileged to, to hear your thoughts and reflections and that you, you share them, that it's important enough for you to sit down, write it, edit it, and know what it takes to make a book. So, um, so really, thank you, and uh, have a great holiday. Thank you, Frank. Same to you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for sharing. Bye bye. Bye. And everybody, stay safe and join us on Wednesday with Avra and Fritz Fritz Roberts. Thank you. Bye bye.